Okay, good evening folks. I'm Angus Miller, director of the Scottish Geology Festival and um, oh, sorry we got a bit of background noise. Uh, and uh, yeah, trustee of the Scottish Geology Trust. Uh, the festival is coming to an end and this is session six of our online course. Uh, we've had great feedback about it and I know that people have been really enjoying this kind of structured approach to, to looking right across Scotland. So it's great to come to our final piece of the jigsaw uh, and also just uh, acknowledge uh, at this stage, a huge amount of work that has gone into preparing this, particularly from Alex Netches, who's done all the, uh, the main presentations uh, uh, and I know that uh, often he's been working uh, really hard to tight deadlines to, to get uh, things uh, finished off. Uh, we much appreciate this effort and it's great that we've created something that will uh, live on in YouTube. I think it will become probably one of the most viewed clips on YouTube uh, in time, uh, the six uh, series, the six uh, sessions of the Geology of Scotland. Okay, so I think we are ready to go and... Uh, Get your popcorn open and uh, your drinks organised and sit back and enjoy our final session of the Geology of Scotland. Session six, over to you, Steph, to play away. We had an introductory session and then each of the last four sessions was dedicated to one of Scotland's terrains, starting with the oldest and continuing with progressively younger terrains until we reviewed all except one, and that is the Southern Uplands, which we'll talk about today. The Southern Uplands is the southernmost and also the youngest of Scotland's terrains, and is separated by the rest of Scotland by the Southern Uplands Fault. Its southeastern geological limit is given by the Iapetus suture, a line that marks the final closure of the Iapetus Ocean. However, because this line is located in the north of England, not far away from the border that separates the two countries, and is mostly buried under recent sediments, what we see on this map as the southeastern limit is an administrative limit, so the boundary between Scotland and England. Among the terrains that make Scotland, the Midland Valley and the Southern Uplands represent accretionary terrains. In other words, they formed relatively recently and were attached to the margin of the much older continent of Laurentia. The oldest rocks in these terrains are not as old as those of the Hebridean terrain or of the highlands, so they don't date back 2,000 to 3,000 million years ago or even more, but are younger than 500 million years. The Midland Valley originated as one or several volcanic island arcs that formed in the Iapetus Ocean, advanced towards the continent of Laurentia and collided with it. Much of the remains of this arc or arcs makes the unexposed foundation of the Midland Valley, and only small remnants of it outcrop within the Ballantrae Ophiolite complex that represents a heavily dismembered section through the Earth's upper mantle, the oceanic crust, and its sedimentary cover. The southern uplands originated in a similar way to the Ballantrae complex. Because the ocean floor is not even but has a variety of landforms, subduction is not a smooth process. As the oceanic crust was sinking under the continental crust, successive slices of the ocean floor and overlying sediments were scraped off and gradually piled under the older slices already accreted to the continental margin. The result is known as an accretionary prism, in which the rock succession is similar to that of an ophiolite, with the exception of the rocks of the upper mantle. Therefore, the oldest rocks of the southern uplands are fragments of oceanic crust and its immediate sedimentary cover, and they're represented mostly by basalt pillow lavas that alternate with chert and are overlain by shale. We've met these rocks in last week's session when we talked about the Ballatry complex, but let's have a closer look at them and see how they formed. Basalt lava 
is one of the hottest and most fluid types of lavas that often erupts at the bottom of the ocean. As it comes into contact with uh, very cold water, it solidifies into a distinctive pulp or pillow. But as we see in the image on the right, while the outer layer solidifies, the core continues to flow, eventually creating a chain of pillows. Jerk is made of the skeletal remains of microorganisms that settle on the ocean floor. In this case, jerk is rich in fossils of radiolarians, which are a kind of zooplankton of microscopic dimensions that have been populating the world's oceans since about 500 million years ago. Shale is a fine-grained sedimentary rock that consists of consolidated particles of mud and silt that are laid down on the ocean floor. Shale is also rich in fossils of graptolites, which are also a kind of zooplankton that is now extinct. As we can see on the map, the succession of rocks that represent the oceanic floor and the sedimentary cover outcrops only on very small areas. This succession is followed by overwhelming volumes of now consolidated sediments called turbidites. And if you remember from the session about the Grampian terrain, turbidites represent terrestrial sediments that are usually the product of weathering and erosion. They are carried by rivers and deposited initially in the shallow marine environment. And from there, they are dragged further away along the continental shelf by very strong underwater currents. When they finally reach the continental slope, which is a sudden and steep change in gradient that marks the transition between the shallow seas and the deep ocean, the sediments tumble down to the ocean floor, where they eventually settle. Turbidites contain all sorts of sediments, from large boulders to fine particles. A particular kind of rock associated with turbidites that is encountered almost everywhere in the southern uplands is grey whack. It's a kind of sandstone that is very hard, very coarse, and as we can see in the picture, contains a random mixture of grains that are very poorly sorted. These grains can have different origin. They can be metamorphic, which means that they originated from the erosion of a metamorphic source, or they can be volcanic, in which case they resulted from the erosion of a volcanic or igneous source. Sometimes they can even be sedimentary, so they resulted directly from the erosion of other sedimentary rocks. When multiple sources were eroded at the same time, this is reflected in the overall aspect of the turbidites, which contain alternating beds where the grains have different composition. Traditionally, the southern uplands terrain was divided into three belts according to the age of the turbidetic deposits. There is a northern belt, a central belt, and a southern belt, which are largely similar in composition. They are predominantly made of grey wax sandstones that alternate with other rocks in smaller proportions. What is interesting about these otherwise monotonous turbidites is that the different grains contained within the grey wax have different origin and hint towards the different sources of the turbidites. Let's start with the northern belt which comprises the oldest of these turbididic sediments, deposited about 460 to 440 million years ago. This belt also corresponds to the Lip Hills supergroup, and the lithology is largely dominated by grey wax sandstones that alternate with other rocks. The oldest turbidites in the northern belt 
are the only ones that do not overlie the basement shales, but are considered equivalents of them. The source of these turbidites have been in part the opiolites of the planetary complex of the Midland Valley. The second group that was deposited contains very old grains whose source were the ancient basement rocks of Laurentia. This source is more likely to have been located in today's Canada rather than the Grampian terrain of Scotland. And the reason for this is that for the grains to have traveled from the Grampian terrain, they should have crossed the Midland Valley first. And in the Midland Valley, grains of that age are very scarce, at least in the south, across the southern Alpine Fault. The following group of rocks is markedly different from the rest. As we can see, not only it occupies a tiny area, but it's not composed of grey wax, but of lavas and pyroclastic material, the source of which is thought to be an ancient seamount volcano. The fourth and youngest group of turbidites from the northern belt is very similar to their second group in that the grey wax sandstones also contain very old grains that are the result of the erosion of the ancient Laurentian basement. Now that we briefly reviewed the northern belt, let's have a quick look at the central and southern belts. These belts contain turbidites that are younger than those in the northern belt but are mostly similar in composition. So they are also made of grey wax sandstones, whose grains represent material eroded from the Laurentian basement. The grains of the oldest turbidites in the central belt originate not only from the ancient basement rocks of Laurentia, but also from a volcanic arc. The erosion was so intense, it affected not only the entire volcanic edifice, but also the deep plutonic rocks of the magma chamber and its associated intrusive bodies. The youngest turbidites of the central belt and the turbidites in the southern belt have a high carbonate content, which resulted from the erosion of a carbonate-rich source, most likely limestone reefs that were eroded by the turbiditic currents carrying the sediments from the continental shelf to the deep ocean floor. Now that we finally have this map where the basement rocks and the turbidites are both represented, we can notice easily that the southern uplands is made of slices and generally each slice contains a base made of narrow fragments of ocean floor and sedimentary cover that is followed by a large tract of turbiditic deposits. For a long while, these slices as we see them were the source of a paradox that was apparently impossible to solve. This is because within each slice, the turbidites clearly become younger towards the northwest, while across all of the slices together, the age decreases towards the southeast. The explanation, which took a very long time to figure out, was actually very simple. As successive slices were scraped off the descending plate, they were accredited to the continental margin in reverse order to the deposition order of the turbidites. Therefore, the oldest turbidites to be deposited were the first to be scraped and accredited, while the youngest were the last. Since the turbidites are by far the most widespread, we can say we reviewed most of the rocks of the southern uplands. However, there are other interesting rocks too. So let's move on to the next unit that was deposited. And the next unit is the Old Red Sandstone, which also occurs in the southern uplands, although it is limited to the eastern side of the terrain, 
And its deposition in that area is unrelated to the three major depositional basins in Scotland. Much like in the Midland Valley, it was deposited in two discrete episodes, separated by a 10 million year gap, represented by a period of no deposition called an unconformity. This interval was marked by the deformation of the existing rocks as an indirect result of the Acadian phase of the Caledonian orogeny, which also marked the final closure of the Iapetus Ocean. In this area of Scotland, the lithology or the composition of the old red sandstone is dominated by conglomerates derived from the erosion of the underlying turbidites, but layers of lava are also present. And here is the picture of the iconic unconformity at Sikar Point. What we see in this picture are slightly tilted horizontal layers of the old red sandstone deposited after the Acadian phase on top of a section of the older turbidites of the central belt. The unconformity or the gap in time between the two rock units is about 80 million years. At the end of the Caledonian orogeny, Scotland was assembled in its current form. And not only Scotland, but the British Isles were in their current configuration as well. With the deposition of the old red sandstone, the two accretionary terrains, the Midland Valley and the Southern Uplands, entered a period of shared geological history. This shared or common geological history between the Midland Valley and the Southern Uplands is best seen with a deposition of the late Paleozoic sediments. If you remember from last time, these rocks are widespread in the Midland Valley, where they occupy about half of the terrain. The very same rock succession is also present in the Southern Uplands. However, it doesn't cover such a wide area and the outcrops are limited mostly to the south and east, with only insular occurrences in the center and west. All of these rocks reflect a cyclic climate change. The oldest were terrestrial sediments, deposited in the same arid environment in which the old red sandstone had been previously deposited. Then, as the British Isles were approaching the equator, climate changed and became increasingly hot and humid. The depositional environment ranged from fluvial to marine, and because of the extensive peatlands, cold started to become more and more frequent. When sea levels retreated, and the depositional environment became mostly fluvial and deltaic, cold reached its depositional peak. After that, the climate became arid again, and this period marked the deposition of the last notable sediments of the Paleozoic era. The Paleozoic era was followed by the Mesozoic era, this is represented locally by the new red sandstone, which, as the name suggests, is younger than the old red sandstone and was deposited at the end of the Paleozoic era and beginning of the Mesozoic era. It occurs mostly in England, but extends as far north as Scotland and is generally represented by sandstones that were laid down in desert conditions. Finally, the colored areas on this map are represented by magmatic intrusions. The dark red and bright red areas are Caledonian intrusions. The dark red ones were in place during the second phase, the Scandian, while the bright red ones were in place during the third and last phase, the Acadian. 
And then there is a multitude of orange areas, which at this scale are very hard to see, but they're concentrated in this area where they mostly intrude the old red sandstone. And they represent plutonic rocks in place during the Bariscan orogeny that mark the assemblage of the supercontinent Pangaea. So these intrusions are coeval or contemporaneous with the late Paleozoic deposits. Now, let's give a short summary for today's session. The oldest basement rocks of the southern uplands are represented by a succession of volcanic and sedimentary rocks that constitute fragments of the floor of the ancient Iapetus Ocean. The basement rocks are overlain by massive volumes of sedimentary rocks called turbidites. These originated as terrestrial sediments that were carried by rivers and later by powerful marine currents and eventually settled onto the ocean floor. These sediments came from various sources that were mostly located in Laurentia, but were also provided by volcanic island arcs that periodically formed in the closing Iapetus Ocean and collided with a continental margin. Eventually, the turbidites, together with the underlying oceanic crust and sedimentary cover, were scraped off the descending oceanic plate and accreted into successive slices onto the continental margin of Laurentia that was represented by the Midland Valley terrain. The Old Red Sandstone was deposited in two episodes separated by the last phase of the Caledonian orogeny. Its occurrence is restricted to the eastern part of the terrain, and its lithology is mostly represented by conglomerates resulting from the erosion of the underlying turbidites. The end of the Paleozoic era was marked by a cyclic climate change and the deposition of sedimentary rocks, including coal, in environments ranging from hot and arid to hot and humid. The volume of these sediments in the southern uplands is not as impressive as in the neighboring Midland Valley. The beginning of the Mesozoic era brought the deposition in desert conditions of the new red sandstone, the younger cousin of the old red sandstone. The Plutonic rocks are of Caledonian and Fariscan age. The first are related to the closure of the Iapetus Ocean and the assemblage of the British Isles. The latter are related to the assemblage of the supercontinent Pangaea that was to dominate world's geography during the first half of the Mesozoic era. Now that we've reached the end of the course, Thank you very much for watching and listening. So huge thank you to Alex for putting these presentations together. And uh, as you'll have seen from his uh, presentations, uh, this reference list at the end of each presentation as well, so you can read uh, get into more of the detail and uh, it's uh, an amazing effort uh, we're all really grateful uh, for the rest of tonight's session we just want to as we've done before just give you a little flavor for what uh, that amazing geological story looks like on the ground and particularly on the, on the coast uh, so first up we've got dr katie strang who's going to take us to the far southeast of scotland to uh, the area that she grew up and introduce us to some of the sedimentary rocks. And I think she might mention fossils maybe once or twice as well. Quite possibly. Cool. So uh, can everybody see this OK? Yeah, that's looking good. Cool. So um, today I'm going to talk to you a bit about a little village called Burmouth, which is on the east coast of Scotland. And it's just a couple of miles from the border 
from England. So if you've ever driven down the A1 from Edinburgh down to Newcastle, you will have gone through this wee village. It's kind of a blink and you miss it scenario though. But for such a wee place, it has a very interesting geological story. So on this uh, slide here, I've got on the left hand side uh, a geological map and in the middle here showing you where uh, Burnmouth is in relation to some of the other places. Now, the reason that the rocks at Burnmouth are particularly important for fossils is because of the age of them, but I'll get onto them in a little bit. So what I'm going to do is take you on a really brief field trip around Burnmouth. So the photo on the right hand side is looking out to Burnmouth Harbour and it is a beautiful wee village and uh, it's quite small. There's Upper Burnmouth and Lower Burnmouth. So down at the harbour is Lower Burnmouth and I lived up the top of the brae and it's a really, really steep hill down. Um, but what we're going to do is look first of all at some of the older rocks that Alex has mentioned in his presentation, which you can see at Burnmouth. So we're going to stop first of all uh, at this little bit here, which is down a road, which leads to a place called Parton Hall. And Parton is a local word for crab. Uh, we also call crabs poos in Burnmouth as well. Um, so edible crabs to us are known as poos. And there's lots of little places like Poo Cottage. And there's a rock called Muckle Poo because it looks like a big crab. So uh, yeah, if you ever hear someone talking about eating poo, they're probably talking about crabs, I would hope. Um, but anyway, moving on, I'm going to show you some of these really cool turbidite deposits. So and these rocks now are sitting almost vertical, um, and that is to do with that Caledonian orogeny and Iapetus ocean closing that caused these great tectonic events. And they've basically just crumpled the rocks like paper. And what's really cool is when you go down the side road called Parton Hall, it takes you past some of these outcrops and you can see them in the cliff. So this is looking up and uh, this is about 30 metres high in um, this cliff and it's incredible. You just see all these funny shapes on the bottom and this is a bit that has fallen down. So quite often these cliffs are pretty unstable and huge big blocks will just fall down onto the road, which is why this little road is only used by residents who live there. And these are uh, flute casts, which are evidence of these turbidity currents. So when these big currents were carrying sediment and things, they would gouge out uh, the bottom of the sea floor and you're left with these casts essentially. And they can tell us a lot about the direction of those currents, uh, obviously not in the falling block because it's out of context. But what I just love is that you can see how, you know, these sediments originally deposited at the bottom of the sea floor are now sitting pretty much vertical. It's just really, really incredible. And um, just along from this section, uh, which is at the same locality, is this bit where, so we were just standing at this section where you see the turbidity currents. And on the other side here is the other limb of the fold. So this is a big syncline. And in the middle of it is a huge big porphyritic dike that was um, put through in the Silurian Devonian period and it is it is incredible so it's got like it's a porphyritic dike and it's about four meters wide that's my bag for scale there um, and this is a cool bit of the um, cliff where we used to play a lot as kids um, and at that point I had no idea that I was climbing over some really really cool volcanic intrusion but it's well worth going to have a look at this if you're ever in Burnmouth. And then um, we're going to go a bit further down, um, actually onto Burnmouth Beach. And this bit down here is known as Parton Hall that I was talking about. So there's some wee cottages along Parton Hall and it's just off to the left in this photograph here. And there, what we have is actually the boundary between the Devonian and the Carboniferous. So these Carboniferous sediments are very early Carboniferous and they overlie the Devonian. So if you remember back on this map here, um, we have all the old grey wacky here, which is the Silurian rocks. And then here we have Carboniferous stuff. And there is this wee lens of the old red sandstone Devonian deposits. So that's what we're looking at there. And there's quite a lot of controversy about where the exact base of it is, but generally the consensus is it's where the sediments go from this red color and change to be the sort of more typical early Carboniferous sediments that we see further around in Burnmouth Harbor. So now we're going to take a walk over to um, where the main bit of the cement stone group is. Now this has been renamed to the Balagan Formation and it's composed predominantly of cement stones and dolomite. It's a very, very hard rock. Um, and that is 
all exposed on the harbour here and on the other side of the harbour here along this area which is called Ross Point and the rocks there as well are vertical and that is not related to the Caledonian erogen erogeny that was related to the early the, sorry the later uh, Barsican erogeny and to do with uh, the fact that there is a big granitic granitic intrusion which is towards Berwick and it's called the, the Beric monocline. So the, the fact that there was all this tectonic activity with this orogeny and a very, very hard basement rock there caused lots of weird deformation of those softer sediments that overlaid it. So you see some really, really cool uh, geology with regards to folding and things along there too. And one of the things about the Balagan formation at Burnmouth is that it's the way it's exposed at Burnmouth is actually one of the most complete sections of it. And it's about 520 meters altogether. And it conformably overlies the Devonian, that, that bit of my slide should say, sorry. Um, so it conformably overlies that there was no thought to be no unconformity, so no missing time between those events. And the really, really hard rock, and what's really cool is they're full of loads of interest in sedimentary structures. And in an earlier course session, we talked about concretions a little bit. And these are some really huge concretions. So that's a hammer for scale there. And uh, these ones are massive. They don't typically con contain fossils or anything, but uh, they're pretty cool. And I just thought it was worth mentioning. It's one of the characteristic bits of this part of the Balagan formation. But what is really interesting about these rocks is the fossils. And um, there was a period at the very early Carboniferous known as Romer's Gap. And this was a term used to describe a hiatus in the fossil record from the end of the Devonian to the Visean. And that was the, the sort of hiatus in the fossil record was the absence of any tetrapod fossils from this time. So the earliest test, tetrapod, uh, tetrapod fauna from the Carboniferous was known from fossil evidence from East Carton, another Visean site, which is later in the Carboniferous. And before that, we had evidence from the Devonian of tetrapods, but only tetrapods that were primarily aquatic. So a tetrapod is um, basically a four limbed animal. So humans, we are tetrapods. And one of the reasons they're so important during this time is because that was when they moved from being purely aquatic to then moving to land. And a lot of research was done, carried out by a team called the Tweed Project, which was fronted by Professor uh, Jennifer Clack. And they did a lot of research looking at this formation and these rocks from this particular period. And within the cement stones, there's a lot of alternation in the sediment. And there's been a lot of borehole hole data recovered to look at the stratigraphy of this. And we know that there is thin horizons, which are known as conglomerate beds. And these are kind of river deposits. And within these deposits in the conglomerate is where you find a lot of the vertebrate material, which is very, very important. So a lot of the material that they find here is very fragmented, very small, and you're looking at isolated bones. Um, and it just totally blows my mind that we're able to look at these and then understand and recreate the animals that were living at that time. And here we have some uh, large tetrapod uh, postcranial bones uh, that were found in this bed at Burnmouth and uh, written about in the paper in 2019 by Clack et al. And on the right hand side, I've included this picture, which is an SEM uh, photographs of some charcoal. And the reason that it was important that they found this uh, charcoal here is because it previously was thought that there was not much oxygen uh, in the atmosphere, it was very, very low oxygen in the atmosphere in the early Carboniferous. But we actually think that is not necessarily true because the evidence of charcoal uh, tells us that the plant material there was actually burning. So there was fires occurring at that time and you do need oxygen within the atmosphere to enable those conditions. So this evidence that's been found at Burnmouth has essentially helped us piece together this missing bit of time, which was called Romer's Gap. And it's just incredibly important when looking at this evolution of when vertebrates first moved from uh, the oceans and from the, the water to then becoming fully land or terrestrial animals. 
And I've got here a reconstruction of one of the most uh, famous tetrapods from the early Carboniferous, which has been officially named Rebo because of how many ribs it has, just so you can get an idea of what these animals would have looked like. So um, you can see it's got uh, the two limbs there and it does have two on the other side, which makes it this four limb tetrapods. And this artwork is by Karen Carr. And there's lots of really great information um, on the Tweed Project website and also on that, the National Museum Scotland website um, about this project. And it has some displays of these very early Carboniferous fossils from Burnmouth. So it's a very wee village, but it's a very important village for its geology. And that was a very, very brief uh, tour of Burnmouth. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Um, as so often is the case in Scotland, of course, you see that just one uh, tiny, as Katie says, a small village, a tiny little bit of the land has got such a richness in, in, in stories. I just wanted to finish um, just thinking about this, uh, this coast uh, as a whole uh, and really the connections between the terrains that we've been talking about over the last uh, six weeks. Alex has been showing us some fantastic uh, uh, digital mapping uh, and the ability to show the information in different ways have been really appreciated as part of this course. Uh, I did want to just take a, a little uh, nod back to the past as well, though, to, to show that uh, we've got this very long history here uh, of people exploring the land. Um, and a lot of that information is uh, much more accessible than it ever used to be. So this uh, is uh, one of the uh, scans of uh, one of the early paper maps from 1963, uh, Archibald Geeky, uh, one of the people involved in mapping that. And I just wanted to take you along this coastline uh, to Sicker Point, uh, which is a really well-known uh, place in terms of the history of geology and development of ideas associated with James Hutton, uh, but also just to see it in, in context. And uh, the, the scans of the, the maps are all available on the British Geological Survey uh, website. Uh, but just to zoom in, uh, because what I find in incredible about this, so Burnmouth is just a uh, few miles uh, off to the east here, um, Dunbar off to the west, um, and just in a very short section of coast, we've got uh, an amazing variety of sedimentary rocks. Uh, Katie's just been telling us about this, this same uh, time period down uh, at Burnmouth. Uh, it's uh, very nicely displayed here uh, between uh, Cove and Sicker Point. Uh, and that ability to kind of travel back in time uh, from the Carboniferous back into the Devonian to the time of the old red sandstone, uh, and then get to see the uh, underlying structure, the fabric of the Southern Uplands, uh, which uh, pokes out uh, on the coast at uh, Sicker Point. So well worth exploring. Uh, we've got some uh, lovely coastal exposures of the old red sandstone at uh, Pease Bay uh, and uh, you can see some of the features of the accumulation of the sandstone and imagine the uh, climates and the topography and the conditions uh, when uh, just a bit south of the equator in the desert zone uh, these uh, sand grains are on the move coming from the mountains to the north and uh, gradually accumulating so some really nice rock uh, beautiful coastal scenery but what brought James Hutton to this coastline uh, was to find the junction uh, between that red sandstone and the overlying younger Carboniferous sedimentary rocks that are uh, along the, all along the coast into East Lothian and towards Edinburgh. He wanted to find the junction between that and the rocks of the Southern Upland. It was an area he knew well. He'd spent about 20 years uh, farming land uh, a few miles inland from here. Uh, and uh, he'd already explored in different places in Scotland, found important geological boundaries and was very much kind of interested in getting his hands on good examples of junctions so that he could tell the story of how natural processes over long time periods had resulted in the different formation of, of rocks. Uh, so in 1788, He's already published his ideas uh, and he's coming to this area really 
searching for a good example, uh, which uh, he hopes will help to uh, convince uh, some of the, the doubters, some of the people that don't quite understand uh, or, or vehemently disagree with Hutton's ideas. So they set out uh, by a boat in June 1788, uh, James Hutton with his two friends, James Hall uh, and John Playfair. Uh, and they decided to travel along this coastline, uh, knowing that when they left the red sandstone behind, ahead of them, uh, was this uh, much more rugged coast uh, down towards uh, Fast Castle. And this is the uh, view uh, looking back in the opposite direction. It gives, I think, a nice sense for, for what difference this junction makes in terms of the landscape. Uh, so north from here, just maybe very small in the, in the distance, see the uh, uh, cement works uh, uh, near Dunbar, where there's carboniferous limestone being quarried and turned into cement. These lovely la layers of red sandstone, Pease, Pease Bay is just, just in the middle here. Um, and Hutton knew that that landscape of the centre of Scotland with uh, flat sedimentary rocks uh, and occasional volcanic pieces uh, was underlain by really good quality agricultural land, uh, very different from the land which he had farmed, uh, which was higher, more rainfall, poorer climate, uh, but crucially had this uh, dark grey stone underlying it, uh, the southern uplands, as Alex has been explaining. We now know, of course, that this is the remains of the Iapetus Ocean, uh, but for Hutton, it was really just a contrast in, in rock types, uh, layers uh, uh, formed at, at different times, and, and finding uh, the uh, junction, uh, which uh, he, he knew uh, or hoped would be visible on the cliff. And his friend James Hall probably had been out for a scouting trip. And one of the big differences that people see along this way is how the, the, the rocks are used locally in the dikes. Uh, and uh, people were well aware of, of the, the change in, in uh, not just rocks, but in the landscape. Uh, so just that second point itself was actually uh, a dike which has got both types of rock mixed in. But of course, Hutton's looking for a natural exposure. Uh, and this uh, is a uh, sicker point uh, viewed from the side. Uh, they came along here on boat uh, on the boat and they were expecting to spend the day in the boat. They were expecting to sit there and to look at the cliffs and to be able to sort of draw a, a sketch of the relationship between the two rock layers. That's what uh, Hutton and his friends had, had experienced elsewhere in finding these unconformities. But actually, it turned out the sicker point was even uh, better than this. Uh, you can see we're getting close. We've got the two rock types uh, visible. So on the right hand side, these steeply tilted grey wacky layers, uh, very rough upturned uh, ocean floor rocks. And then you can just about catch in the grassy slope here, just little bits of red sticking out. Um, that's fine, but it's not quite what James Hutton is after. Uh, but fortunately, around the corner, uh, lies the amazing uh, outcrop, uh, a big rock platform, uh, which is the junction uh, between uh, the two uh, rock types, uh, beautifully exposed uh, at Sicker Point. So this uh, picture is from uh, a leaflet published by the Lothian Borders Geo Conservation Group, part of the Edinburgh Geological Society, and you can find a copy of the leaflet on the Edinburgh Geological Society website. And uh, the view from the top of the cliff, looking down onto Sicker Point uh, with uh, these lovely hard grey wacky sandstone layers, almost vertical, uh, running out to sea uh, with the red sandstone perched on top of it. And the cartoon on the left hand side shows the, uh, the, the view as Hutton saw it in terms of being able to uh, lay this out in a, in a series of chapters, uh, the accumulation first of, of the grey wacky sandstone. We now know, as Alex has been telling us, uh, it was laid down in the Iapetus Ocean uh, and then crumpled and uplifted uh, to form uh, dry land, uh, eroding away and then buried under the layers of red sandstone. And you can see from the picture that the red sandstone layers are slightly tilted themselves. So, so there's uh, uh, ongoing uh, tectonic activity in a story. And, and also worth pointing out that as Hutton realized that uh, the view today is just the latest chapter in the story uh, of the formation of, of uh, the rocks here and the formation of the landscape. Uh, Hutton realized that the natural processes that you could see the evidence of in the rocks of Sicker Point uh, were also uh, visible uh, today with the changing, slow changing landscape. And so the person with a long enough uh, 
geological uh, understanding could uh, stand and look at uh, this landscape and imagine how it would continue to change into uh, the future. So it is uh, a very important site. Many people call it the most important geological site in the world. Uh, but when you go there, you won't uh, be uh, surrounded by hordes of other people. It's a very peaceful, natural place. It's at the bottom of this uh, steep, uh, grassy slope, uh, but uh, it's uh, well worth uh, the journey to go and, and see uh, how this influenced uh, the development of ideas, uh, how particularly this nice, clear example that Hutton found towards the end of his life uh, helped to uh, really take these ideas forward. And it really forms a basis for our modern understanding of the, the rock cycle uh, long before plate tectonics Hutton was recognizing in these uh, stones the evidence of uh, ongoing processes and change and uh, ocean floor being translated into uh, into uh, land and, and, and buried. John Playfair was a very important companion that day and he tried to sum it up by, by this quote the mind seemed to grow giddy by looking so far into the uh, abyss of time that uh, ability to, to see uh, back the different stages of the formation of these wonderful rocks it also fits very nicely with our course over the last uh, six weeks uh, because uh, this really uh, captures the, the story of Scotland and the uh, the Caledonian orogeny, because these tilted grey rocks that uh, uh, form the basement of, of Sicker Point uh, are part of a whole series that we've talked about over uh, the last few weeks. Uh, there's so much of Scotland, you see this evidence of continental collision uh, and the formation of the Caledonian mountains. It is the big episode in, in Scotland's uh, geological history, uh, and we've teased out the different details of the, the metamorphic activity and the tectonics, uh, the formation of the, of the granite. Um, but also, once all that had happened and this continent had assembled and the bits of Great Britain have been brought together for the first time, uh, at Sicker Point we see the start of the next chapter uh, as the, the mountains uh, erode and the old red sandstone starts to accumulate. Uh, and as, as Katie said, it's really nice in this, in this part of the, the country, there's also this evidence of how life is changing uh, through exactly the same time period and life is coming from uh, being uh, solely in the oceans and starting to come out onto land and it's great that uh, in this little corner of Scotland there's evidence uh, of that as well. So uh, we've had quite a journey over the last few weeks. It seems appropriate to finish at uh, the most important piece of, of Scotland's geology uh, and uh, see how uh, these rocks have helped to not just understand Scotland, but to understand the world.